So today we're doing day two on linear regression. Um, I'm calling semi-parametrics and visualization. Um, so let's get started. So first what I wanted to sort of talk about is, I think it's worth thinking a little bit about why linear regression is so popular, especially since kind of where the course is going to go is we're going to do a lot of other things that are not linear regression. Um, it's kind of useful to think about why though it is the default for most folks. So what's kind of the reason? Well, one big reason is it's, it's fast, you know, analytically it's easy to solve matrix inversion. We've sort of a lot of work is done to improve the computing power of this. There's good reasons to like it as an estimator. So OLS is, you know, has all these nice properties that we learn in econometrics. It's, you know, best least unbiased estimator has a lot of really nice, um, properties, but I think those are kind of, those are part of it, especially the speed on it. But I would say that one of the reasons why linear regression is so um, popular is it it's very sort of intuitive, like in the sense that it's very robust. It's a, it's a very good default in the sense that things that are better options are really only good under certain settings, whereas linear regression is kind of equally bad in all settings, but also equally good. So it's a very good default to start when doing data exploration. And so that doesn't mean you should always do linear regression, but it's a very good place to start and you kind of understand the properties of what's going on. It's a very good intuitive summary of data relationships, right? So it's this, this scaled covariance measure. Um, and it really does a good job with a lot of the things that we throw at our models, especially now in um, the current way that we do applied research. So. A big one that I'm not really going to touch on today, but will matter when we talk about other settings is it we do linear regression does a really good job with lots of fixed effects, for example. So why does that matter? Well, long story short, we'll talk about this when we do a little bit on um, nonlinear models, but uh, fixed effects, a lot of times they're not consistent. We can't consistently estimate them, estimate them um, just because we don't have a lot of data for them. And in a nonlinear model, basically in anything other than linear regression, those the inconsistent estimates would mess up the the things that we're interested in. Whereas in linear regression, we sort of, we can still do things um, correctly. So that that's a I think a really powerful case for OLS is kind of the default approach for a lot of um, applied researchers, especially in economics. Um, so. And what we're going to talk about today is kind of the ways in which um, researchers sort of stay in the world of linear regression, but kind of try and present and improve um, the presentation of their data, staying in the world of kind of linear regression, but allowing as much flexibility as possible. So it's a little vague, but kind of this idea of linear regression being kind of the, the way that we focus on things but trying to allow for more flexibility than just making things um, align. And, I'll elaborate on that in a second. And then I, I sort of as a side goal, I'm going to, um, I want to talk a little bit about the end of kind of improving um, visual design. It, you know, you could do a lot on this and I don't really have the, the class time to kind of go into this, but I have a lot of strong feelings. I'm going to kind of show some examples, um, happy to talk more or kind of try and do more on this subsequently. So let's kind of talk about the general framework of causal relationships, relationships. I mean, we've talked about this before, kind of a functional way in which you can think about these things. Without any structure, we sort of say, well, why is this very flexible relationship between the thing that we care about, <coughs> you know, DI, which we said before was, sometimes it was binary, but it could be this continuous variable that we care about. Sometimes we have things like controls, like XI that we need to condition on, or there are things that we want to allow for heterogeneity in. And then we have some kind of unobservable uh, noise, epsilon I, that we're allowing. So this is like very within person uh, unobserved heterogeneity. This is really allowing for a very flexible functional form um, between the relationship between YI and, and DI and XI. And, you know, above and beyond the problem of estimating this so it, you know it's very challenging to estimate these sorts of things when you don't allow the error term to be additive was just sort of allowing for a fully flexible formulation is this is really this is hard to estimate and even 
kind of more importantly in my mind is it's sort of hard to report what it is, right? So there's a lot of work that sort of is like, oh, we're going to estimate this very flexible functional form. We're going to do this thing that's going to allow for really unrestricted heterogeneity. And sometimes you do all that work and then the question becomes, well, I don't know what kind of the summary takeaway is. Now, I know there are ways to kind of put stuff on top of this. You can ask the right question. But a lot of times as researchers, what we'd like to know is kind of simple um, takeaways, for example, kind of compared to statics or interesting um, causal effects that we think matter. So, you know, in this setting I did, right? So what do we do? Do we talk about the marginal derivative of F at different values or do we take the average of that over many values? Um, this is kind of, I mean, right. I mean, this is the causal effect that we talked about, right? This partial of F with respect to D at a conditional value. That's, you know, if, if D was binary and X is say gender, this is saying, well, what's the causal effect of the treatment for men versus women? And that's a very reasonable thing to report and estimate. But as you allow D to become continuous, for example, or X to become higher dimensional, then we have a lot of things that we want to report. And we want to start thinking about what are the best ways to summarize that data. And so what a simple linear model lets you do is it really simplifies this problem, right? So in the simple linear model version of this is saying, well, we have DI, we're going to additively separate it from XI and epsilon I. Well, when we look at this derivative, right, that becomes really easy. This derivative in this simple version of it is just tau right? Tau is the derivative of this function with respect to D, regardless of what you condition on. And so you have a, sing a single summary measure of this. You can do a more complicated thing. We could allow for heterogeneity in DI, and then we'll have different values of this conditional and different values of XI. Um, if we do this heterogeneity, then it's not a single number either. So there's an element to which having a single reportable number is, is really useful. Um, okay. So intuitively, what's going on in a lot of these, in a lot of papers, we want to plot some outcome YI and describe if it's sort of more supposed to be descriptive rather than causal, or we want to assert some causal effect from some variable DI. So I'm taking some examples here from data that I had on hand of papers that I've worked on. I'm not necessarily going to assert something is causal per se when I show this, but like on the example on the right, um, here I'm looking at um, data across states where we have the state level uninsurance rate and we're looking at state level um, credit scores and, you know, we the, the points are states themselves and the, the dotted line is reflecting the, um, the line of best fit for these. And so, you know, the line is a useful summary statistic, right? So we kind of know if we reported that, that number, we'd say, well, that would give us a sense to which a decrease, an increase in uninsurance, a health, this was health, um, health insurance, the uninsurance rate for um, health insurance, that an increase in that, we see that those places tend to have lower um, average credit scores. But kind of the point here, right, is that in this graph, you can kind of see this already. Now, obviously, there are these ones over here that where it's already where it's not quite in line with the line. But this kind of negative relationship uh, is kind of obvious from the underlying data. So why would we need the line? Well, you know, once you start getting into a lot more data, it starts to get kind of hard to see the the the, the relationship that we're interested in. So I, I don't want to assert that it's causal, but if it was a causal relationship, this quite plausible, we wouldn't be able to see it in the underlying data, right? This is the zip code level version of the same regression. And I mean, I, I think if I hadn't put the, the line there, you would have a lot of trouble seeing anything in that underlying data. And so then it's very hard in part because we have so much more variability. Um, there's just a lot of features that that cause or are related to credit score that are above and beyond the uninsurance rate. And so um, it's important to have a line of summary to sort of explain what's going on. So the line is a really good fit there, right? Well, the line becomes more complicated and more generally plotting this relationship becomes more complicated because much of the time we're interested in multivariate relationships, right? So we, you know, we are interested in having control variables. So we have some sort of causal estimate conditional on a set of covariates W. And that's something that we want to be able to talk about in this kind of graphical setting or more generally in a summary way. 
So to set this up, first, let me do an aside. I think some of you will have seen this before, but this is worth kind of getting to. So um, let's start with an aside where we're thinking about these covariates W. So if W is discrete, um, we could think of the effect of D on the outcome variable as some causal effect, but only conditional on fixed effects. Then what happens when we do OLS regression? When we run an OLS regression where we're conditioning on W, what coefficient are we getting out from doing OLS when we run that regression before? So we had the coefficient, the, um, sorry, the function here, right? So we had, oh, I called it XI here, I'm sorry. So, but the YI, DI, and then these controls, if we put the controls there, like what, what is the way that putting dummies in here is going to give us what our, our coefficient is on tau? Or excuse me, on D. So in the propensity score setting, it's really straightforward, right? Where if we needed to condition on W, it was very easy to think about. We'd say, all right, well, there was a tau that we'd estimate for every given W. That's the expectation of Y for the treated versus the untreated. And we would get this, and then we would integrate up over the Ws, right? There would just be this way in which we'd weight up all of our individual tau Ws. These are conditional average treatment effects. effects. We could do that using inv inverse propensity score weighting, for example, or matching. With OLS, we don't do any of that, right? It's like a one button thing. And so the question is, you know, given that it's done automatically, what's going on? What, what estimate is it getting us? Um, we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about the Arnau and Miller example before, but we're gonna actually talk about the exact um, relationship now. So when we do a regression like this, we have this set, set up here, right? So now I've got the correct notation for this. So beta W is our set of controls and we have this tau. Well, what kind of the, the proof in the pudding comes from um, thinking about what's called residual regression. So think about the projection of D and Y onto W. So this is by projection, I mean literally running a regression. So if W and D weren't correlated, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. If W was not something that was correlated at all with D, they were just random, then we wouldn't have to worry about the, um, this particular thing. But a lot of times you have to condition on it because they are correlated. And so define the projection matrix P here as this matrix. So this looks, anytime you don't, haven't spent a lot of time with econometrics, this looks really funky, right? So this is called a projection matrix. It's a symmetric matrix where basically you have the W, uh, missing a prime, I'm sorry, this should have a prime here. Um, so I'm actually gonna put it up in the background because you'll be able to see intuitively why this thing makes sense. So P of W is just W, W prime inverse, right? So it's this nice symmetric looking thing and it's, and, oh, and sorry, most importantly, it's N by N. And so what it is, it's called a projection matrix. So it has a, a couple of interesting features that are worth knowing. So one is that the projection of, do, of W onto W is just equal to W. That makes sense. That's like, and you can see that arithmetically, right? If, it, if I multiply this by W, then the inverse cancels out with it and you get back W again. It's what's called idempotent. Which is, if you remember your linear algebra from, from undergrad, is that if you do PW times PW, you get PW back. And really all that's saying is if you project something that's projected onto W, again onto W, you just get the same thing back. And, that's be, and that makes sense. And really what's notable about this is that the projection of D onto W, what that gets you is the predicted values from a linear regression of D onto W. And the way that you can see that is I want to make sure you guys can see it. Let me switch the camera. So the way to see that is that say I do PW times D. Well, that's equal to W W prime inverse W prime D. Well, this is a regression coefficient, right? It's the regression coefficient of D of W on D. That's gonna give us gamma. And so then we'll get gamma hat times W, 
which is equal to d hat, right? Which is the projection that comes from this regression. So you're getting the predicted values from this regression by doing p times d. Then hopefully that sort of makes sense. Basically, this is just a nice summary way of talking about the predicted values from a regression. Any questions on that so far? Okay. Now we have something called the annihilator matrix, which is really, I think, probably the peak of the econometrics profession. Um, the annihilator matrix is basically one minus the projection, right? So I here is the identity matrix because you need it's it's a matrix as opposed to a single value, but it's basically you have a projection, and now I want to do one minus the projection. This is going to give us the residual from this regression. So if we want these UIs, we want the piece that's orthogonal to W, then what we do is we project D onto W. We get the gamma hat um, WI. And then we do DI minus that, and that gets us UI. And it turns out all you have to do is do this annihilator matrix times any of these, and that will give us the residual. So what this is called is getting the um, residual from these is going to get us the piece of, uh, of D that is not correlated with W. Okay. Oh, this is a typo. I'm sorry. These should be M's, not P's, because we're, we're residualizing. So I'm, um, this is, you know, first while Lavelle is what this is we're doing. And this is I'm very proud of this title. Um, so basically the point is, is that if we residualize Y with respect to W, so this is, these are annihilators, not projections. So it should be Y star is equal to MW D. And same thing, or Y, excuse me. And same thing that D star is MW um, D. Once you've done that, you've residualized those two pieces with respect to W. And it turns out running a regression of those two pieces onto one another, you're gonna get the same tau out. You can see that basically by just pre-multiplying this um, equation here, if we did it in the vector notation, you'd pre-multiply here by the residual M. This would residualize your D, your Y. This piece would go to zero because W is perfectly orthogonal to the residual matrix. And then you'd have some residualization of the error term. But the coefficient would be identical. So this is basically, this is the first while Lavelle theorem, FWL, and it's really powerful. And we're gonna see why it's really powerful um, for a number of reasons, but it, it gives you a really simple way of thinking about a bivariate relationship once you have any multivariate relationship, you just say, okay, all I need to do is residualize the one that I'm interested in with respect to the others. And then I can just compare any to any one bivariate relationship. So now that we have these tools, we can go back to that setting that we were talking about where we were asking, well, what happens now that I have controls? What is the estimate that I'm getting out when I do OLS? Well, what I get is Say I have these Ws, uh, for example, that are discrete. So then it's really demeaning um, D and Y. That's basically what it's doing then is it's demeaning D and Y within each group in order to make them so that they all have uh, mean zero within the same. And then fitting a line pooled across all of those observations. And what this, what, basically what you get with this regression estimate is that what's going to happen is, is that the overall OLS estimate is going to be this weighted combination of the underlying um, the underlying conditional average treatment effects. For any given W, what it's gonna do is it's gonna weight the, the coefficient by this variance term, which is the variance of the, the, S, the, um, the D, which is your thing that you care about, your causal regressor, the variance of that for each given uh, WI. So you're gonna upweight the ones that have high variance and you're gonna downweight the ones that have low variance. So those are the ones that are gonna be heavily influential in your estimation. So part of the reason why, um, so it's sort of interesting, right? Is that like, first the OLS version of this is really gonna put a lot of weight on the ones in the groups where you end up getting a lot of variation to identify your effect. 
versus the ones where you have less of that is going to get less weight versus if you did um, your P-score approach, right? If you did the propensity score weighting to average things up, you might get a, a sort of a different weighted combination of treatment effects. Any questions on that? How many of you have, do I have a, oh, I don't have a poll here. Oh, that's too bad. It's fine. I'm not gonna, I have, I don't, I have, don't have enough time to do a poll if it's not set up. I was gonna ask how many of you would have known uh, first, first of all, Lavelle beforehand. So if you wanna see this um, derivation, this is, I mean, it's kind of nice just to work through it, but it says it's in 3.3.1 um, in the mostly harmless econometrics. Okay, so next. So why are we going through this? So the reason is, you know, visualization was easy when it was just a bivariate relationship. But once we get into this setting where we care about multivariate, then it starts to get a little more complicated, right? So how do I think about controlling for these things? Well, we could plot the line. That's easy. We know we can still estimate that thing. We could have just plotted the line, but it's really nice to lay the line over the data, right? That was the whole point in that bivariate setting. So one idea is, well, why don't we exploit first while Lavelle and plot the residualized components, right? So this is the W star and the D star, which are these points we've residualized out the controls that we're interested in. And so in this context, I'm taking that same regression, but now I'm residualizing for state fixed effects. So conditional within the state, kind of what is the, the relationship between these? And so I've demeaned them. So the, the average, I've demeaned the, the local ins insurance rate and I've demeaned the average credit score and we get, and basically we plot the slope and we can plot the overlying data both. And this is basically the relationship controlling for the state fixed effects. Now, part of the thing that's a little confusing here, right? Is that it's demeaned. So it's a little hard to intuit what's going on. What is it? You can't really have a negative 600 credit score and you certainly can't have um, a negative on insurance rate. And so these things are a little unintuitive. An easy solution that you can do is you can add back in the, um, the overall means. So what I've done here is I've just added back the mean of the overall uh, uninsurance mean to the X variable. So it's D star plus the mean of D. And I've added back in um, the mean of credit score to Y star as well. And so now the credit score one is a lot easier to interpret. That's just, you know, this is in the right support. But what's a little weird, right, is that on the, X ver on the X axis, the adding in the mean doesn't guarantee that the values are going to be um, on the right support. You still have negative on insurance rates. And that's because you know, adding in the overall mean doesn't fix the fact that some of them are getting shifted off of the support. So kind of a very natural thing here, what, we, what have we done? We've plotted the data in a nice way that like it's consistent with doing the residualization. And we've been able to summarize it in a nice way using a line. And that's very nice. So we've, we can control for things. We can condition on things if we need it for, um, if we need it for strict ignorability. And we can kind of be really, we can exploit the fact that we're able to um, have the data and visualize it. And the question is, is can we do more? So residual regression was really powerful and it would be really nice to do something more flexible. So, you know, when I plotted that data, it wasn't totally obvious that a straight line, the OLS line is, is the line of best fit, but it's really hard to know what is kind of the best line of fit because there's so much data. And so is there a better way to kind of try and approximate what we're interested in, which is the conditional expectation functions. And so what's a way to approximate this? So. What I wanna quickly do as an aside, because I think that this really typically doesn't get defined to people, um, at least certainly wasn't defined to me, is kind of um, defining the definitions between what I would call parametric, semi-parametric and non-parametric. Um, so just as like a, a definitional um, thing. So when somebody talks about a parametric model, really the idea is that the model is such that the data generating process or the sort of the, pro the statistical process that's specified 
is specified as a finite with finite dimensional parameters. So for example, in the linear regression context, um, what we're specifying is that, well, there's a yi and a di, a single parameter beta, and then the epsilon i is generated from a normal distribution that has a variant sigma squared, for example. So everything there's, all we'd really need to know is, is this is all conditional on X or conditional on D. Um, all we really need to know is, is sigma squared and beta and, and we're done. We can kind of, we know the full data generating process. Um, a non-parametric model is kind of the reverse case in the case where the data generating process is basically infinite dimensional. So it's this idea that that's always sounds crazy to me when people say that out loud, but it's really this idea that I'm allowing things to be flexible. And so I don't know what the function looks like. I can draw it on the board. I can, I can, it's some flexible function. The reason we call it infinite dimensional is because subject to other restrictions, if something is continuous, for example, that I need basically an infinite number of parameters in order to approximate it as best as possible. So if you know, like, the stone wire strauss theorem for example if we're as soon as we're allowed to say that it's like continuous and differentiable all we need is kind of we can approximate it very closely by allowing a, a high dimensional polynomial right we can, can approximate something very very close um, to the to the right value by using a very very high dimensional polynomial and so that's that di high dimensional polynomial is the infinite dimensional parameter that we need to worry about to approximate it so more generally, though, when people are saying non-parametric, the idea is that they don't want to specify a model um, for the data generating process. They just want to fit something by using the data to kind of capture certain moments of the data. What's semi-parametric is basically most things that we do. Um, even OLS, when we do things with robust standard errors, that's a semi-parametric model because we were saying, okay, well, we don't really know how the errors are distributed. We're going to say it's flexible. And then, but the beta, for example, is finite dimensional. So we're going to say that the rest of it is finite dimensional, but then we've got this epsilon that we have to worry about. And what's useful in this setting is to distinguish between the idea of infinite dimensional nuisance parameters so nuisance parameters are things that we don't really care about. We don't want to estimate them. We don't, they're not something, an object that we need, but they affect our ability to do either, to either estimate or do inference on things that we do care about. So in this context, we can calculate beta without knowing um, theta i, but if we want to be able to talk about um, the variance of beta or beta hat, we have to at least be able to, we don't have to estimate them directly, but we have to approximate them in some way. So remember we had to use those epsilon hats squared in order to do the robust standard errors. So that's a nuisance parameter setting, but sometimes we have parameters of interest that are high dimensional that we care about. So namely, what if we wanted to flexibly fit a function for our, between our relationship between D and Y? So if we were gonna say, look, we have some data D, we have some outcome Y, and we want to fit a relationship between the two of them. And we don't want to say that it's just purely a line. We'd like to kind of show graphically what it looks like. And then here is an example. So this is going to be additively separate. So we're going to have some error term on it. And then we're interested in estimating this function f. So theta is kind of is going to be allowed to be infinite dimensional. And there are a lot of ways in this literature. So this is a big econometrics literature. Um, what has really blown up, and I'll talk about the intellectual history in a little bit. Um, for applied people is to use something called bin scatter, which is using spaced bins to construct the means. And I'll talk about exactly how it's constructed in just a second. But, you know, why is this useful? Well, a lot of times in our plots, it's, it's hard to see the underlying conditional expectation function. So remember, we showed that I showed that plot where when I show all the data, it's just a, a mess of noise. And there's this line going through it. And you're like, and you say, okay, well, the line is negative. So there must be a negative relationship but I can't really approximate the conditional expectation function. So what you do is you use these averages within 20 equally spaced quantiles to, um, and you take means within each of these bins. So this is, um, I think this is one of the first ones. I didn't spend enough time really making sure I got the first example in modern papers that was doing it, but Raj Chetty has been a big um, proponent of this approach. 
And this is a paper by um, Raj and co-authors from 2011 about uh, Project STAR, which is a, an experiment that was done in Tennessee to randomize kids into kindergarten classrooms. And um, part of the paper that they're doing is they're showing that kindergarten test scores are highly correlated with average earnings subsequently. So this is done, you know, this is done in the in the 80s, this experiment, I believe. And so then what they did is they linked it to IRS tax records 20 years later. So what they're saying is that where you are in the kindergarten test score percentile is highly correlated with your mean wage earnings um, at age 25 to 27. And so what they've done here, these are not you know, these are not the full data set, but instead what they've done is they're plotting, there's 20 bins and they're plotting the average within each bin to show that the conditional expectation function is increasing um, with this test score percentile. Um, what's notable, so they also overlay what the regression line would be. And what's notable here is that, you know, it follows pretty carefully. I mean, I think you'd be okay with saying that the fit is roughly linear, but what's notable about it is that it's not, exactly linear, right? There's plenty of cases where maybe you would say that it's it's kind of more concave than linear. I, I think you could debate it, um, but it's useful to kind of show the, how, how uh, much correlation there is. So I think the two things that are worth noting here from this very nice graph uh, is first, the R squared is enormous. So this is the R squared from the paper. So this is a 5% R squared, this rela bivariate relationship, which honestly in the space of bivariate relationships is pretty good. Um, in economics, but it does mean that there's a ton of variation that's unexplained, right? So remember that the R squared is the sum of the squared explained over the sum of the squared total. That means 95% of the variation around these points is unexplained by this relationship. And so there's probably, if you plotted the true scatter plots, there would be a ton of uh, white noise around these. So the second thing that's a little bit odd about this not odd per se, if you look at this, you say, oh, this seems pretty reasonable. But if you push on it, you say, okay, well, why did we choose 20 bins? And why equal, why 20 equally spaced bins? If these variables had been discrete, right? If it had been like, there were 10 class, or not a classroom, if there were 10 uh, discrete values going upwards that you could have only been binned into, then that would have been natural. But this is actually test scores are a continuous variable, right? Like why pick one thing versus another? If this had been A, B, C, D, or F, right? If, if people only got a letter grade, then it would have been a very natural thing to bin into. But instead, what they've done is that they've kind of smoothly picked 20 bins um, to put this into. How was a bin scatter graph made? This is coming from this paper that we're about to discuss quite a bit uh, by Cataneo and co-authors where, so what's the basic construction of a bin scatter plot? So uh, the graph on the right is kind of a version of what we just looked at, right? Obviously, this graph looks a lot uglier uh, because it's not a, it's not linear. But the idea is that there's an underlying distribution of data points. That's the gray dots, and then there are they've picked ten equal um, ten basically observation weighted spaced bins. So they they cut the data into ten um, deciles, and then. They took the average value within each decile to fit the midpoint. And then they took the average of the Y value to get the where it sits there. So it's basically the centroid within each point. That gets us these blues. And then you can obviously fit a line there if you want it. And this, is, this kind of shows why you might want to show a bin scatter versus say a, um, a just a fitted line because you know, it's quite plausible that the fitted line is wrong, right? This certainly looks much more um, quadratic. Okay, so let me just kind of show you um, why this can kind of come up. So the choice of the bin is really not obvious, right? Like why 20 or 10 or whatever. So here's an example of, this is from census data. This was made by me last night. Um, this is looking at income, the correlation between income, total income at the census, at the household level, against whether or not um, individuals in a household have health insurance. And so I've done 10 uh, deciles, I've done 10 points. And what's sort of notable, right, of course, people who have very, very low income, there's, uh, there's this zero that's kind of low. 
And then it, it jumps up and it's relatively flat. And so I picked 10, sure. But picking the how many bins you pick kind of influences your interpretation, also the location of them, but more importantly, the number. So here's with 20 bins, that starts to look a little different. And then, you know, with 50 bins, really you start to see kind of much more of an interesting shape. And there's also this interesting kind of jump up here. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but there's this jump and then it seems to go back down. Now, is that statistical artifact? Is there actually something interesting going on there? It's unclear. So this is basically a statistical problem. It's the point of this paper that we're about to talk about. The Cataneo et al. paper on, it's basically called on bin scatter, is really trying to kind of formalize the intuition of what's going on in bin scatter. So when bin scatter kind of was initially proposed, uh, it's it was done a little heuristically, not heuristically, I mean, the motivation for it is quite sound, but this is kind of really trying to formalize the non-parametric, semi-parametric aspect of it. So the first contribution that they do in this paper is they say, look, the traditional bin scatter approach is doing a particular type of non-parametric estimation, right? It says, make the bins, take the average value. Well, kind of implicitly, it's this is coming from a, a non-parametric assumption that says, let's just assume that the value is constant around this value, right? So you, this is what's called a regressogram. I think it was not, not quite as good as annihilator matrix, unfortunately. Um, and so you can see this is kind of what the conditional expectation function is. It's this flat line across it. It's constant within bin. This is not crazy, but you know you could maybe do more. Like you could allow for piecewise functions to be flexible within this, right? So now what it's saying is instead of enforcing this thing to be um, to be flat within, you could say, well, actually, what I'm trying to do is I want to fit a, a piecewise line within each one of these. Or you could even enforce that there's these um, point-wise lines and then enforce that there's a smoothness constraint. Like for example, that the lines have to touch each other as you cross from one bin to the other. And all of these are trying, so the graph here, the graph in gray, the line in gray is the true conditional expectation function. And now we've kind of done a much better job approximating it, right? Like relative to the regressogram, it's it's the initial one, this is it's kind of much closer. Um, that's kind of their first point is just to say, hey, look, think of this as trying to approximate the conditional expectation function. The way that you're doing it is, is not unreasonable, you could, but obviously you could do better. The second is to say, look, how you choose the bin, once you realize you're doing, you're approximating this conditional expectation function, this is a tuning parameter that you think of in an estimation problem, namely that I need to choose a number of bins. I wanna kind of do a good job approximating the conditional expectation function. So it's a trade-off between bias, which is that picking too few bins makes your function look off, and noise, meaning that you pick too many bins, and so it's very noisy. And so in the setting that uh, the traditional, what's called the canonical bin scatter, there's kind of, they derive results for this, where it shows that, you know, the number of bins is kind of approximate to um, n to the cube, like, so, I don't know, or the cube root of n. So there, I will talk about this in a second, they have software that can do this directly, but really the idea is that obviously, and it kind of makes sense, right? As you get more and more data, you should probably have more and more bins. It kind of makes sense you'd have more bins as you get more data. But what's interesting is prior to this paper, more or less people just did 20 bins because that's what Raj Chetty and co-authors did. Yeah, Daniel, go ahead. Okay, so what's also kind of important about this is that I didn't get too much into this, but remember from the example, I pointed out that like the number of bins you choose can influence your interpretation a little bit. And so by having this thing that's data-driven, you're kind of tying your hands a little bit to avoid data-driven data snooping issues. This is the same issue that comes up, for example, when we'll talk about um, regression discontinuity, for example. The third contribution comes back to re this residual regression point. And so, um, you know, our approach when we were doing this graphical version was to residualize DI by our controls, right? To do residual regression. But think about it now. So, you know, here, what we're saying is, well, we have some functional, we want to allow for some flexible thing between F and uh, D and Y, and we want to have some control. So we'd say, okay, we're going to use first of all, Oval, and we're going to residualize. 
But the problem is, is that we can't residualize D and then get back F if F is some nonlinear function. So hopefully, like, I'm going to show you an example in just a second, but just take a look at this for a second, right? Like if DI was a line, if so, if, you know, it was tau times DI, and then we had some XI here that we were going to residualize on that, then we could do first law, while Lovell and it would be fine. But once we will start wanting to bin the D and show a flexible functional form between D and YI conditional on these regressors, that you can't residualize D with the X and then use the bin versions of D to get it back. So I'm gonna make this concrete in just a second. That the problem with this is that if you, the historically the default that people use for this, when you use residual regression, this is what it was doing. It was residualizing D with respect to X and then doing the bin scatter with respect to those residualizations, which is not gonna get you the same thing. So to give you an example, here is that graph again, where now I, I think I'm doing it with 20 bins. Um, maybe not actually, no, this is 10 bins, sorry. Um, I'm doing three things here. So the correct way to view what's going on here that you, you, what you should be doing, if you wanted to control for this and you wanted to bin stuff out, is what you do is you'd say, all right, let me bin D. So I'm gonna bin D into 10 bins, right? So that should be straightforward. That's like, I take the distribution of D, I cut it into 10 deciles. I generate a dummy for each bin. Then I run a regression of YI on each of those 10 bins and the controls, and I get back the coefficients. Those are gonna give me the right approximation to F. So on the graph on the right, what we have here is, if you look at the green, green dots, that's that first graph I showed you, where that was, that first graph was saying, I'm just doing bin scatter with no controls. That's fine. That was just here. We had the green, it was down here and then it jumps up and then it goes over. Well, if you do bin scatter with controls, the original version of this command, you get this weird, these yellow lines. So what you get here is what it's doing when you do that is it first residualizes DI with respect to X. Uh, and then what it does is it plots, it bins that residualized measure and plots them, and then it adds back in the mean. The problem is, is that in contrast, I did the regression version here, where what I did was I binned D, I ran the regression, I got the coefficients back, and I added in the means in order to get the means to line up. And you notice with this blue graph, well, the blue line with the, the residualized version of it, I see the blue dots here and it goes over. You don't, the yellow line isn't even close to approximating what the blue function looks like. So there's a right way to do it, which is this regression version way of doing it. The default way of doing residualization in bin scatter is not right. And you wanna be careful about this because the whole idea is what you're trying to do is approximate this function, which is different than the function of Y star on F star D star. It's just a totally different function. Is that clear? Do people understand what I'm saying? Okay. And the final contribution that they do in this paper is they say, look, given all of this that we're just talking about, there are ways in which you can think about testing features of the conditional expectation function. You can put confidence intervals around it. You can put uniform confidence intervals um, around it. You can test features of it, like is it monotonic, stuff like that. These are all things that people who do non-parametric estimation get really excited about. It's not obvious for applied researchers. It's super useful, but they have a really nice package um, which is on this website, where you can um, plot it. So here's that graph. This is the one with no controls. And this is doing their data-driven way of doing it. So you notice I, I enforced a certain amount of smoothness. And then it's a data-driven way in which it picks the number of bins and then it enforces the smoothness. And I get this really kind of beautiful looking conditional expectation function where we see this weird, interesting dip or, as a function of income um, near the poverty line. So this is, you know, this is the federal poverty line. This is for people who have very, very low income. And it's kind of interesting that you see this bouncing. And what's notable is you can add in controls. And first of all, then with the fixed effects or the controls, I put in controls for age, sex, and state of residence, you get a lot more uncertainty, which makes sense because it's just kind of um, 
there's more residual variants, um, but you still continue to kind of see this bump um, at the near the federal poverty line, which is interesting and sort of something you could explore, maybe due to Medicaid eligibility thresholds, et cetera. The one annoying thing in this package is that the levels are off. So you'll notice the level here, it should be the average insurance rate is like 0.94 in the sample. But because of the way they do the residualization, they don't add back in the means right now when you do covariates. So that's annoying. You could always add it back in yourself. Um, but the, the thing coming out of the package isn't exact. I think the key point here that I want you to take away from this. So this is a very cool package and it's worth exploring. I will say that there, I actually should have put this in. I'll put this in in the slides for next time. There are other packages that are less, they have a lot, you know, they have a lot of stuff in their package. If you go to their hub file, it's like 1800 things you can do with it. I mean, I spent like the last 40 minutes talking about all the things that they do in their paper. It's kind of one of those things where maybe less would have been more, frankly. Um, if you want to do bin scatter and you just want to fix this thing that I told you about, where don't do the first, don't do the residualization wrong, you can either do it yourself directly, which is what I did here. There's also a package called bin scatter two, which I'll put a link to here, where if you do this option in it in Stata, it will just correctly do the residualization. It won't, it will not enforce the wrong version of it. So that's something just in case you are interested in this is something you're going to work on. Basically use bin scatter two at the minimum and do the correct residualization if you're going to control for stuff. So that's basically do not mess up the Frisch Wall Lovell point. Like that's the main thing I want you to take away from this. There's a lot of other really cool, interesting things here, but I do think that that the bare minimum is that I want you to take bin scatter and do it correctly, not like have it, the wrong inference. Um, taking serious the estimand really adds a lot of tools into your toolkit. So I have, I mean, more seriously is there are a lot of papers that I've had to referee that say things like, you know, the bin scatter points line up with the line. And so we're very confident it's a linear specification. And it's like, well, there are formal ways to test this. So this is a thing that you can actually test now, um, which is formal. Kind of the point in the end, coming back to the original point that I was saying is that, you know, a lot of these approaches are basically buttressing a point, like supporting the point that of a simple reported linear number. Like, so this is from a paper that I have where we do these bin scatters on both sides and that's fine, but in the end, they're pretty linear and like, we're gonna use the linear version when we do the underlying 2SLS model. This is the first stage of a, of a, a regression equation. But what it's really powerful is by plotting both of these is that we've demonstrated kind of a very, we've really supported kind of the underlying specification that we've done here. And it's very compelling of what's going on. I mean, I'm not gonna, get into the details of explaining this one because we have a bunch more to get through. But conceptually, we were trying to highlight this fact that we see big changes between the group that's active and exited. And we see really strong differences there. And if we had just plotted the regression lines, there would have been a lot more worry that maybe we're just being driven by certain outliers. So why was bin scatter so successful? So bin scatter was really successful it's, what's interesting about it is it's pretty new. So for those of you who attend the finance lunch, you know, you'll hear John be like, I don't understand what this graph is kind of thing. Like there are, you can go to lots of places where even it's been 10, 12 years that people have been using these, but it's certainly not the status quo. And there are people who are not familiar with it. It's becoming more and more common and it's become a staple for a lot of people in public finance and labor, but it's become very, it's really successful. Um, and in part, it's due to the growth of um, the, just the, the amount of data that we have in a lot of settings. It's really successful way of improving kind of data visualization communicator results. And frankly, it's a much, for, I think it's a huge improvement over big regression tables. So I basically got talked out of the idea of showing other people doing bad things. So now all of the things that are bad are going to be examples of papers that I wrote where I did bad things. So this is a paper that I published from like five years ago where we have, um, you know, this big funky table where there's all these things and it's like, this is really unhelpful. And we really only care about like one or two numbers anyway. And it, 
it's probably masking a lot of underlying variation. This is really kind of a poor way of communicating results, frankly, and I'm going to get into that. But bin scatter, part of the reason that, that it's become so successful is we've had a move to being interested in a few causal effects in the sense that there's really only one or two things that we care about, these Ds that we've been talking about. And so plotting that relationship has been a really valuable way to kind of um, drive home the, the validity of whatever approach you're doing. So if you're going to do a line, being able to show that the conditional expectation function roughly approxim is roughly approximated by a line. And if it's not, then doing something that is, for example, quadratic or um, taking into account kind of um, the skewness of the distribution. Um, this, I think, I think you can't think of these as being separate. The kind of the, the research design, the, the credibility revolution in part, the reason it's successful is not just the idea of being able to focus on research design, but it's also in terms of the credibility of presenting your results and visualizing those results is a really useful way of doing that in, in my mind. Um, so what I wanna kind of end on in the last, uh, I guess 25 minutes is, 25 minutes. Yeah. Uh, it's talking about kind of ways in which I think you can improve visual design in papers um, and kind of in improving communication uh, more generally of what's going on in your results um, in your papers and actually, frankly, in your presentations more generally. So any questions before we kind of pivot to that? Any questions? Well, so here are my, like, I call these design goals, but these are kind of, they're like uh things I'm trying to achieve, but I don't necessarily always succeed at. Um, and I think are good goals to have in mind. Um, I'm open to other ones if people have suggestions. Um, the first is kind of minimizing tables. So Ilsa kind of uh, uh, front ran this one a little bit and I'll, I'll, I'll probably rant again in just a second about it. The second is to have kind of what I call describable goals for every exhibit. That's a little vague, but all I really mean by that is the idea of you know, you have an exhibit, be it a figure or a table, like it should have a point. You shouldn't just be like, okay, now I have to do blah. Um, I, I, you know, this is kind of a challenging thing where we want to present a lot of data and things to front run referees and to support, um, to show that we've done a lot of work. But I worry sometimes that we don't have a, a reason why we do every figure or table. Um, the third is, we should really focus the reader. And what I, what I say is craft not ugly figures. So I'd love to say like, we should always make nice pictures. Everything should be beautiful. We should all spend a lot of time on it. A, you may just not care that much. Frankly, I get it in the sense that I'm like way out on the limb here in terms of how much I care about this. And it's not obvious this gets you published or is kind of the, the main thing going on. But I think on the flip side of it, you should at least not be doing like hideous looking pictures. Like there are the, the returns on work to figures are like super convex, right? Like you can do a little bit of work and get really big returns um, initially. Um, so um, I think that there are places where you can do, and I'll show you an example where I think you can, at the minimum, not make something ugly. And I still think that people do a lot of ugly figures in modern day things that it's like, that is sort of unacceptable in my mind. Um, and then the last thing that I think is worth highlighting is like, don't mislead your readers. Um, I think there is like design choices with figures, which especially with things like bin scatter and other things where you start to worry like, well, I'm trying to guide the reader, but I guide them in a way that is misleading. And so that's always important to, to avoid. Um, I think within figure, I just don't have the time or frankly, it's like challenging. You could do a whole course on this to kind of how to do good figures. Um, there's this really amazing book that John Schwabish just came out with that I recommend, am I holding it? Yeah, it's on the syllabus. This book is amazing. This is the book, it's this and then the, the book by Kieran Healy. Um, it's all, this is all on the syllabus, but you can get a copy. Um, Kieran Healy's is available online for free. Um, this one is not but it's really nice and has a lot of good examples. And he kind of gives a, a large, um, really a bunch of really great overviews, but his kind of guidelines that he does in his initial couple chapters is he says, and I think this is good is, you know, one, the idea is to show the data, try and show as much of the data as you can to sort of 
avoid, to kind of give the readers a sense of what's going on. Second is reduce clutter, try and avoid kind of map, uh, like chart junk. The third is integrate graphics and text. So we'll talk about this in a second, but it's like put your legend inside the graphic rather than having it be super far away such that it's, it's hard to tell what's going on. Four is avoid providing extraneous information. So he's, he calls it something else, but the idea is like, you're trying to show the data, but at the same time, if you provide so much information that nobody knows what's going on, then it's not worth doing. And then five, he has this thing that I am trying to start to do, which is kind of start your graphic when you start designing it, design it in gray first, with the idea being like, look, put the data up there first in gray, without like colors and like, don't, don't allow there to be so much um, going on in your graph color wise and kind of shape and everything else wise. Cause then when you put it up, you'll say, okay, well, I can't really tell me as the reader, I can't see X where X is the thing that I wanted in the graph. And so by starting with gray, you'll say, okay, I need to highlight that in some way. And so the way that you'll do that is by coloring it or by giving it a different shape or emphasizing it by increasing it in thickness or things like that. Um, so that's really useful. Okay. So I kind of talked a little bit about this already with Ilsa, but um, I think minimizing tables is important. Uh, you know, ironically, I, I've gone and looked at a bunch of Raj's papers and I, I if you, the Chetty group, um, the Opportunity Insights group, what's interesting is that their presentations and the things that they do for public consumption are all graphics. So they, if you go to the Opportunity Insights website, um, you go there and you look at their papers, they have like four types of documents you can get. You can get the, the paper, how it's published. You can get the like the memo write up that they have for practitioners. You can get their PowerPoint slides and then they have like their working paper version, right? Their published paper version typically doesn't have that many figures. So I would say that Raj and co in their published versions are not hewing to this as much. But then you look at their PowerPoint slides everything is figures. There's almost no tables presented. So I think, you know, this is all a choice yourself. My view is the tables are better in the online appendix. My, the reason for this is I think tables actually make it very hard to compare results and contrast things. So tables are useful and they're important storage of information, but they tend to report things that are unnecessary and they make it really hard to compare results. So one fact that I do want to highlight is that one thing that's very common, I, I, the Raj and Co don't do this, but when you have controls in your regression, say you need to put in controls in order for strict ignorability to hold, you have a case for that. But those controls are not something that you care about or you, or they're not meaningful. You don't need to report the coefficients on those. Those are not interpretable anyway. Um, if you're conditioning on something in order to get strict ignorability, the things that you're conditioning on, those co coefficients are not meaningful in the first place. And so don't bother reporting them in my mind. Um, this happens a lot in finance papers. For those of you who are not finance people, this will be meaningless, but they're like corporate finance papers where people report like eight coefficients and then you describe all of them. And you're like, this is totally purp like purposeless. This has no meaning whatsoever. And so don't bother reporting them is sort of my view. Or at the minimum, it shouldn't be in the main text or part of it. And this is kind of true. I think that minimizing tables is value even when not doing regressions. So, you know, here's a couple of examples of places where I think you can do better. So remember last class, we talked about this Imbens and Colasar paper. We were talking about uh, the Barron's Fisher problem. And I was showing you this graph about the different estimators. So this table one on top is from their paper, which frankly, I find really annoying. Um, so you have this table. Here's all these different estimators they do and they have a lot of them. So it's understandable that they need to do a table. There's a lot of data embedded there, but they have five different simulations and then they show these coverage rates. And so these coverage rates, what you're trying to do is they need to hit 95%, right? So 95% is what you're going for. You have, they're all, we're doing confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals. It's really about, did you hit 95% or not? Well, it's like unreadable to tell which ones are doing a good job and which are doing a bad job. I don't even bother reading the tables a lot of time when I do these, I just read in the text what they tell me I should be reading because it's so hard to understand. Versus I'd like to think, I made this graph for you guys using four of the estimators here. 
and I put a horizontal line at 95. I mean, you guys can just tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's a lot easier to tell that the red bar is kind of consistently hitting 95 and the rest are struggling. Now, it didn't need to be quite so long. It didn't have to go all the way to zero. There are better ways to have plotted this. Um, frankly, I just doing this really fast. But this is a much easier way to read this table relative to the um, what they did above. Now, back to the original point is there's a lot of information that needs to be stored. And so I'm sympathetic to the idea that we have to have these tables. But it does seem like putting a little extra work into this, we could maybe see some really cool visualizations kind of demonstrate exactly why one is so much more effective than the other. So that's not even an empirical result, right? This is all simulations. Um, here's an example with regression output. This is from a paper that I did um, where, the, oh, there's my son. Um, the, the, basically what we have is we were doing a regression where we were looking at, we had our, these causal estimates that we had calculated using regression discontinuity. And we wanted to know what was correlated with it. And so on the top is a regression table where you're kind of storing what's going on here. We have all these regression estimates and I mean, you can look at them. It's things that you'd be interested in and you can go and see which ones matter and in what settings. It's kind of hard to tell, especially now that we got rid of stars, right? So actually, you know, I think there's good reason to want to get rid of stars. In So in the AA journals, they, you now aren't supposed to report statistically significant stars on certain coefficients. And that's great. The idea is to try and avoid p-hacking. But it becomes even harder to be like, okay, well, which one am I supposed to look at? It's like, which one's significant? Which one's not? Which one is like at least big? Which one is not? Versus on the bottom, now, I don't think this is a perfect graph, but we've rescaled things in order to make them interpretable. And you can see, okay, well, which ones, or at least the 95% the, the confidence interval doesn't include zero, which ones are big and small? And sort of what is the relative comparison in this setting? I think this is, this is a very easy way to report multivariate regression coefficients in a way that doesn't require you to, um, I mean, basically you can see, do all the comparisons that you want to do without um, needing a table that makes it kind of challenging to compare the different estimates. It's very quick. Um, so that's, and then also what's nice is that so, you know, even you can compress a lot of information. So that last one was just showing two things that we had basically, we were doing per capita and per newly insured. But on this one, we wanted to show with different models. So this is, a, I understand there's a lot of stuff in, going on in this regression. This is not, this is like appendix figure 812. This is clearly not perfect. But, you know, even in a setting where you have a lot of models, so we had no fixed effects, region, division, state fixed effects, you can show the different coefficients and you can actually see how the coefficients change under the different models in like a really, it's really easy to compare them in this setting versus if I put them next to each other in numbers, you might struggle to sort of know how the relative sizes change. And then lastly, you know, for those of you who do more theory, um, what's really nice is you can even do these graphics rather than putting all your model output as tables, you can do them as figures. So this is um, from a paper that I did using machine learning and had a little structural model of credit allocation. And so there was an, this is one of the outputs here where we were contrasting kind of the effects under the random forest model versus logit. And so, the, so this is getting a little to what we were discussing where here, where we're still reporting the numbers in the places here, but we also have this graphical component, which helps do the kind of the draw the eye to the relative comparisons between the two above and beyond just looking at the numbers. Um, I think this is something that is potentially underused by people who are doing theory be, and just kind of all these numbers that are put up kind of contrasting things, whereas a visual version of describing these things could be really powerful. Okay. That's one, that's my views on tables. Um, number two, this idea of describable goals. So when you're considering a figure, for most papers, you want the result to be obvious. So what do I mean by that? A research paper's exhibits are not typically exploratory, right? So there are things online in like, journalism will do this a lot, right? They'll say, we got access to this data, we wanna present it in a way that our readers can kind of explore and find their own relationships that we're interested in, right? That's a very common kind of newspaper article that people um, will do or bloggers or whomever. 
I don't think most research papers are trying to do that sort of, you have a very, you have a very strong thesis that you are trying to communicate to the reader and you do, you want that to be clear in your exhibits. So if it's not, when you look at an exhibit, if it's not obvious what the goal of an exhibit is, probably one of two things is happening. Either one, you're putting too much information in the exhibit or you're, it, it's, you're highlighting too much stuff all at the same time. And so the story that you're trying to tell is lost. Or two, you have too little information um, or you have too little highlighting of the relevant piece that you're interested in. And so in the Schwabash book, John Schwabash um, describes this as pre-attentive processing. So this idea of what can you do to try and emphasize certain pieces of a figure for the reader to make it clear. So that can be as simple as, you know, I'm trying to think of even here, right? So if you think about this Imbens and Colossar um, simulation, by putting this black line here, it could have obviously been thicker and kind of more emphasis. I'm highlighting that being close to that bar is a good thing, right? There are other ways that we could have emphasized that more. We could have said, we could have put text above the bar that says, um, you know, conservative and below it could have been like not conservative enough or whatever you want to say, under coverage. So the idea of being like too high is bad, too low is, is bad. We want to be as close to the bar as possible. And those are ways to kind of improve this uh, figure in order to kind of help with that point. Okay, number three, uh, craft, thou shalt not craft ugly figures. Um, now that I'm going to see a bunch of you give seminars, now you'll know that I'll be, I'll be sitting there just I'm too nice of a person to say something mean, but I'll be thinking about it. Um, I know that for a fact that there's huge variation in how much researchers value figures and we're not being evaluated on how nice of pictures we are. We're being evaluated on doing good research. But I do think that there's no good reason to have bad figures. Um, I really think that this involves a small amount of work for big returns. So think about this figure on the right. I This is kind of like the textbook um, example of an ugly figure in the sense that I'm using all the defaults. I have edited nothing and then I'm plotting. This is actually from that, um, that plot where I did the residualization and then I added the means back in. And so take a look at this figure. So here, this is from Stata. Could have been R, R's defaults, frankly, and ggplot, I don't really love either. Um, but here, what could we do, right? So what's some things that we could do? Some simple things. So one, we could fix the scheme. So the scheme... It's kind of annoying, but scheme is this setting of um, kind of is the default settings that changes a bunch of the graphs. There are a bunch of schemes that you can find online. So the biggest thing is that this blue background is the default and is really ugly, especially when we put them in presentations or in papers. Um, we could label our axes, right? So the, the, the graph labels are awful. Um, we could make the color scheme clearer, right? This blue and red is kind of impossible to read. We could thicken the line fit so it's there and we could lighten up the points and we could also label things better, right? So to give you an example, I think this looks a lot better. I mean, I did all the things I just told you I did. I don't wanna like give myself too much credit, but that's a lot better looking graph than the last one, right? I like formatted the X axis so that it's padded zeros. I labeled it correctly. We did some shading on the dots. Like that was not very much work. And I think it substantially would improve a graph when you present it. It's sort of easier for the reader, et cetera. Um, kind of commandment number four, if you want to call it that, is don't mislead your readers. Um, or you know your audience members or whomever, um, you know people perceive things in certain ways, and you can exploit that for good or for evil. So that by that I meant you know we were talking about this pre-attentive things. People gravitate to the things that we emphasize in figures, and so we want to emphasize those things in order to help them process it. But we also don't want to like put things in there that make them assume things that are wrong about the data. So here's an example from my own work. Um, so I've actually changed on this. So this is from a paper where um, we were looking at bankruptcy flag removals and the effect on the labor market and credit market outcomes. And so this is kind of an event study. It's what's well, a difference in difference. Um, and we're looking at the relative effect around chapter uh, 13 removal, that's zero. And these are coefficients from a, um, a regression. And 
we typically have this period by period effect. But so, you know, these are periods that are discrete. And so we really shouldn't be implying smoothness that isn't there. So in this graph, you know, in this graph here, I have this dotted line that's kind of implying this like uniform smoothness over periods that are not in the data set. Like in the sense that I only have, these are like quarters that we're looking at data, but it kind of implies that I have this uniform um, confidence interval that's not really true. These are point wise confidence intervals I'm reporting. I should be reporting them as if they're like that. So this is kind of a better example in a more recent paper where here what I'm doing is these are the point wise confidence intervals from a regression um, and so I'm reporting them with these caps that don't imply some kind of smoothness between one period to the other. I, I know this seems a little subtle, but it is misleading the way that I presented these point-wise ones. And here it's actually accurate. Um, and if we wanted something that was more uniform or smooth, we'd have to make additional assumptions that would work there. So this is kind of, and relatedly is, you know, you can improve your graphs. I think I have continued to try and update and improve my graphical design. All graphs can basically be improved, but it doesn't mean you have to improve every graph. It's like, there's clearly a point in which returns are low and then you stop, um, you can revisit, you can get better at your defaults, et cetera. Um, basically in the, you know, just to conclude on this, some of my, our, my friends were like, oh, you should just talk about how to make good figures. It's like hard. You have to kind of go through examples I had in mind, I was like, oh, I'm gonna go to the AER and I'm gonna pick people's figures and we're gonna go through and talk about what's bad. First of all, I have no interest in making those kinds of enemies. And second is like, there, you have to kind of really be in, in it. Like you, I can give an idea, if you brought me a figure, I could be like, do X, Y, and Z. That's sort of what we talked about um, in this example, right? There's some very obvious things that you can do at the bare minimum, but Probably in this setting, there are better things that we could do. We could be, we could say, okay, what is it that we're really trying to show? What is it that we care about, et cetera? Um, and so, you know, I'll give some basic ideas of places to start. So bar graphs are always a really good place to start. Like bar graphs help shows like simple means. They're really easy. They're clear. You don't need to explain bar graphs to your reader. Um, you should usually make them horizontal so that the labels are readable. That's like an obvious easy thing that everybody gets wrong, including myself historically, right? Like if you do vertical bar graphs and then you have like different words that are pointing downwards in the graph, that's pretty unreadable. So just flip them so that they're horizontal. Don't put confidence intervals on bar graphs. Use like point ranges instead. Directly label your figure as much as you can. It makes it a lot easier for the reader to pay attention to what's going on. Fix your units, you know, round numbers, add commas, put dollar signs, do zero padding, stuff like that. Those are like low cost to add, but really make stuff look easier to read and more polished. Label your axis, but put your Y axis label at the top of your graph rather than turn 90 degrees on the side. I know this is my own personal preference. There are other people who feel differently. I think they're wrong, but obviously I, 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 I know there's not like a true, uh, a truth to this. There's this thing called the Gestalt principles to, as a way of trying to highlight things in your graph. Um, John Schwabisch talks about it in his book, which is like, think about the things that you can use as points of emphasis. There's shapes, thickness, how saturated something is, the color of it, the size of it, the, what kind of marking you use, where it's located, the sharpness of how, um, how, how strong it is. These are all things you can kind of use as a way of emphasizing things to the, to the reader. Basically the point is, is this is really hard. Making good figures is hard. We're not the New York Times. We don't need to make insanely polished figures, even though sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna blow people's minds. It's like, even the figures I'm most proud of, like this is one of my most, the figures I like the most that I've made recently. It's not that impressive. It's like a connected line graph with a bunch of things on it. Like the New York Times does these ridiculous things that are way more um, over the top. So really the way that you should think about it is most of our results are simple, right? Like we're trying to communicate relatively simple things in our plot, but we have lots of information and we want to communicate it in a clear way that is convincing. And so my view of it is like, what we need to do is think about a polished way to provide a piece of the information that you want from your graph and make it such that if the reader understands that a, huge, a large host of other information is also easily polished. So like in this graph, in the end, you know, this is an RD at age 65. It's not that complicated. If we focus on the orange line, we say, okay, well, it goes along. And then there's this jump in the insurance coverage. I can understand that one piece. 
And then I'm like, what are all these other things? Well, it's all the other states. I have to read the le the legend for this. I could have done a better job by saying, oh, you know, other states in gray or, you know, putting other states written in. There's a limit of what I think is necessary. Um, and that kind of shows the variance over there. And I say, okay, I kind of get this. I get a national change at 65. And so this kind of gets to your question kind of here, I'm just writing the regression result in the, in the chart. In part, this was like innovation driven by the AER insights restriction on exhibit numbers. So like you only get five exhibits. So it was like, okay, everything's going into the figures. Um, and then once you know that graph, you can read all the other ones. It's much easier to read all the other graphs once I've done that. And so there's this like multi multiplicity that is very useful um, in doing this. So that's it. Sorry, I went over a couple of minutes. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, I will see you guys on Tuesday. Um, and I need to post the solutions. So sorry about that. Anyway, uh, talk to you guys soon.